Mm -hmm. if I, if I the line is the line, the what? The line the is not, not like this. That means resonance, and that has to do with electrons. It's a different thing. Take OCHEM, and I'll tell you why. It takes practice too. You can do a, you can do two regular arrows if you want, but you can't put both. You can't have a double-headed arrow unless you're talking about electrons moving. All right. So I got us started here a little bit. Reminder: If we're trying to find KP, we need the equilibrium pressures of everything at at the end, we're only given an initial and a final for one of our compounds, right? It's, it's balanced already, so you should always, if you're given something that has coefficients in front of your chemicals, you should always double check it, but I believe this is balanced. If you don't see any coefficients, then you probably have to balance it unless you get one of those lucky reactions where everything has a coefficient of one. So how can we go about figuring this out? It's anytime we wanna know we have something changing, a concentration changing, it's never a bad idea to look at it as an ice table, right? Initially, it, only contains 0.5 atmospheres of sulfur trioxide. So we can say zero here and here for our initial row and 0 0.500 here. And then what else can we fill in here? Good. We know, as long as we know at least one final pressure, that's going to allow us to fill in the rest of this table, right? Um, if you, you can think about it almost like, like doing a Sudoku or something like that, or a logic puzzle. If you're given enough pieces, you can work your way backward to figure out the rest of these, right? So we've just been using the change is always, we've been filling it out as just minus X or minus two X for all of these, right? Or plus X as appropriate. So what's X or how do we fill this out here? Are we going to be gaining or losing sulfur trioxide? And if we call X is base, we can think of X as basically how many times the reaction happens. So every time the reaction happens, it takes two of these and it makes two sulfur dioxides and it makes one O2 molecule, right? One oxygen molecule. The other thing to remember about these ice tables that each one of these columns is an algebra expression. 0.5 minus 2x equals 0.482. So that's enough to figure out what x is, right? 0.5 minus 2x equals 0.482. x is 
point zero point what? Point zero zero. So once we know what X is, we can fill in the fill in this, right? Point zero one eight and point zero zero nine. Now we have all of our pieces all set up, right? Last thing we have to do to get our final answer is just plug everything in here. So we're going to get KP is equal to 0 0.018 squared times 0 0.009 all over 0 0.482 squared. you said yeah so quick reasonableness check does that make sense with the numbers that we have up here at the very least when you're looking at equilibrium expressions you can kind of divide them into three categories they're either going to be greater than one less than one or about one if you if at equilibrium you have a lot more product than reactant. That means that, is it gonna be greater than one, less than one, or about one? Greater than one. Just think of this fraction as being products over reactants, right? And you, all you're doing is comparing the relative size. So if you have a lot more reactants at equilibrium, which is the case here, we would expect it to be less than one. And if they're roughly the same, concentrations at equilibrium, then K is going to be close to one. And when I say close to one, you know, that I'm, I mean, like within a factor of 10 or so, you know, anything from 0 0.1 to 10 is probably, you could consider that close to one in the context of these. We're dealing with such big and such small numbers. So just right off the bat, we expected it to be small. We do get something significantly less than one. How many sig figs do we get to keep here? Just one, one right? 0 0.009. I guess we should. Is it though? Let's tr let's track our sig figs back here from our algebra expression. We had 0 0.500. Zero minus 2x equals 0 0.482. So then when you do that subtraction, you get 0 0.018 equals 2x. So I guess, yeah, we do get to keep two sig figs. So it should be 0 0.0090. So within, with sig figs, proper rounding, we get 1.3 times 10 to the times 10 to the minus five. All right, so these ones aren't so bad when you have an equilibrium concentration, right? And just a reminder, even if it's not an equilibrium problem, if, you, if you're tracking more than one thing changing concentration, this is a, totally reasonable way to actually show your work for a theoretical yield problem, like we did on the front pages for, for this week's assignment, right? You can do it just showing it your work all with conversions like we've done in the past. This is basically gonna give you the same math. It just allows you to track everything changing at once so you don't lose anything along the way. So how are we feeling about equilibrium in general with that? Still a little shaky? Let's do a trickier one then. Here's a reaction. <laughs> we have KP. We have initial concentrations. 
what's the final concentration of everything? And just a note about the language here. Um, in chemistry, when they say each species, that's another way of seeing each molecule or each compound. It's more more universal because then because if they say each species, then um, that applies to both elements and compounds. So it basically just means everything that's in your in your reaction. So here's another it's another ice table problem. But now we can't solve for x quite so cleanly. We have to do our substitution for and to our equilibrium expression to solve for x. So start by filling out your first row and your second row. When we start with both reactants and products, how can we how do we know which way the reaction is going to go? You can assume the way it's written that it's going to go left to right. But as we showed in in was it number four that and uh, this week's assignment that had you work backwards, right? The, the good news is as long as you're consistent, when you solve for X, you should be, you should get a number. You might get a negative value for X. If you misjudged, if I put a plus here and then minus X and minus X, then I might get a negative value when I solve for X. That just means that I put the wrong sign on my X's here. Depends, they're not all symmetrical functions. If they're symmetrical function in the in the math sense, then you then a plus and minus um, would give you the same, you get the same answer both as a positive and a negative. A lot of these are not symmetrical functions, so. What's the other way we can tell? Can we, if at equilibrium, if we're gonna reach equilibrium, can we ever have zero of anything? Now we can have really close to zero, but if that's a zero, then our K expression is not gonna work, right? KP for this one is gonna be pressures. Pressure of hydrogen, pressure of bromine over pressure of hydrogen bromide gas. If this is, if one of these is zero, can it be at equilibrium? And we can't have less than zero. So if as long as any one of these components is zero, you know it's always gonna move, you're always gonna make more of whatever's on the side that has zero, right? Because you can't end with this as a zero and it can't be a negative number either. Just like we, this also can't be zero, right? can't divide by zero. All right, so if we're gonna plug this in now, all we're gonna do to get our equilibrium pressures is just total up each column, 0.75 minus two X, X and X. 
then we have a value for KP, so 4.18, 10 to the minus 9 equals X times X over 0.75 minus 2X squared. What's that mean? Oh, yeah, no, I just didn't, I didn't see that. Usually, we're, I'm so used to starting with zero over here. Thanks for catching that. So at this point, you can plug it into a solver. Or this is also a good candidate since K is so small. K is very small, which means we can be pretty certain that X is going to be really small, right? And if X is really small, then our equilibrium concentration of HBR is going to be really close to 0.75 still, isn't it? And our equilibrium concentration of bromine is going to be really close to 0.1. So... Showing our work for that one, we say assume x is approximately zero. Then we can say 4.18 10 to the minus 9 equals x times 0 0.1 over 0 0.75. All of a sudden, that's really easy to solve. I mean, algebraically, don't need to break out um the uh, quadratic equation or anything so what do we get as a value for x four times ten to the negative eight two sorry two point four Is that less than 5% of what we started with? What, what would, what's 1% of 0. 0.75? That'd be 10%. So 0. 0.0075, right? We're way smaller than that. So X is way less than 1% of what we started with, which means our assumption was valid. The way you show your work, if, you, if you're going to make this assumption to make the algebra easier, you have to write assume x close to zero. And then you have to show that you went back and double checked or at least considered it. You don't actually necessarily have to do the math, but you can say, is x less than 5% of our initial concentrations? Um, if you wanted to write a, if you write, want to write a question in mathematical terms, rather than writing it out, one of the ways you can do that is you just put part of a question mark, the top part of a question mark on top of your less than or equal to sign. So is X less than point, point zero 0.05 times our initial concentration? Yes. Assumption valid. New sir. Did I see a hand over here? No, no, no. Okay. What do you have to do if you're to show your work if you're not making that assumption? Yeah, you just have to write, I used the solver on my calculator or I used Wolfram Alpha. Did somebody who, who used the solver to, to solve this? Would yeah. you still have to put the square on there, like from the... Sorry, yep. I'm being sloppy today, I'm tired. It's Friday, everybody's everybody's tired, I can tell. I'm not nearly as chatty as you usually are. Does that change our answer? Did you do that right? 
Who gave it? Okay. Okay. So if we don't make the assumption, is X any different within SigFix? Probably not. Sorry? So if we didn't start with zero here, or if we started with zero here, then it would affect X when we solve for X because we'd get X squared on top instead of, we'd wind up with something that's about 10 to the minus four instead of 10 to the minus eight for X. Yeah, with, with, when you've got a, a, a K value that's this, that is this small, that assumption winds up being a pretty good assumption, um, which is another way to get around the issue we were having trying to use solver for that 10 to the 34. Um, problem yesterday. If we just use that assumption, like, and and solve it this way, we can get the right answer without having to deal with, you know, rounding errors and and programming errors that way. Jacob, as as long as x is less than five percent of what you started with, if x is less than five percent, then the difference when you subtract it is going to be really small. Um, and generally that, that winds up happening usually when K is around 10 to the minus five. Um, although in certain cases like this, like if we have to start with this, with some of, uh, one of our products, that's going to make X even smaller because it doesn't have to go nearly as far towards the products to get to that right ratio. So it's kind of hard to write a, um, a general case, like as long as K is greater than this or less than this. That's why we always have to go back and test it at the end, just to make sure fully. Does it matter which one you're checking that assumption with, whether it's the Technically, you should test it with both of them. Um, but as long as it's, it's, you know, pick the smallest one, as long as it's valid for the smallest one, then that's gonna be good. All right, so, Equilibrium is kind of a tricky concept, and we're doing a lot with these ice tables that we would have shown by hand earlier, right? But at the same time, once you get the hang of it, it's the same thing every time. Make sure your reaction's balanced, fill in everything you can, and you're either going to be solving for X by looking at one of these columns, if you have a final and an initial concentration for something, um, or you're going to be able to solve for X by plugging in your end point expressions into our equilibrium constant. All right. So I'm thinking at this point that next week's next week's assignment like I said, it's, it's probably going to look a lot like this, the one that we had on Wednesday. I'll probably put at least one um, multi-part equilibrium problem that's going to be just a, a whole bunch of, of practice with ice tables, simple ones where you just do what we just did like six times in a row, something like that. Um, just because, you know, I, under, I know that everybody understands the general logic, but when you have a blank piece of paper in front of you and you have to start from scratch, it can be a little bit tricky. So we want to really drill, drill it into your head, just like we did with the nomenclature. Um, so we'll do a lot, fair bit of repetition and there will be some problem solving ones too that'll be a little more interesting. All right. Any more questions about equilibrium before we move on? Or about the practice problems or any of the ones from from this week's assignment. You said you know when you switch the order it's going to reactions or products. Mm -hmm. You said you'd get a negative answer. Would that still be the right answer is just negative or okay. yeah because if you write the if you came up with say for the last one we solved x was negative two point four times ten to the minus eight. If we had, had our expressions backwards, if it was 0.75, yeah, 0.75, if we said plus 2x instead of minus 2x, 
that would get a negative there. So when we plug it in here, we'll still get the same answer at the end for our final concentrations. It doesn't really matter. It just helps you like calculate the okay. And it makes more sense. We don't want to say, oh, it's plus X, and then we got a negative number. Like that doesn't really make sense with what's physically happening. Nope. Um, but mathematically, it should be fine. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't mark you down for that as long as you've tracked your negative through and get the right answer at the, at the end. If you did, if you said plus two x, but x wound up being negative, and all of your final concentrations make sense, then that's fine. All right. So last last couple of things we're going to talk about there. It's a gas a gas topic and an equilibrium topic, but they're both related to the idea of statistical thermodynamics, which is that idea that we were talking about the other day where it's not quite a Boltzmann distribution or not quite a Gaussian distribution. Um, yeah. Yep. Where we had, remember when I drew this and we said, well, we can't have negative kinetic energy. Um, Boltzmann, I knew that there was, there's a, uh, a kind of, you could call it almost an early version of a meme from back in the eighties when this textbook was written, there's a textbook called phases of matter, um, by, by the author's name is Goldstein. Um, and, uh, his, he has, it's sort of a, a legendary opening. Um, this is just the first page of the textbook. Ludwig Boltzmann, who spent much of his life studying statistical mechanics, died in 1906 by his own hand. Paul Ehrenfest, his student, was carrying on the work, died similarly in 1933. Now it is our turn to study statistical mechanics. Perhaps we should approach the topic carefully. <laughs> um, making light of, of a heavy, heavy thing, but really, Boltzmann really was a very, um, he, it was actually kind of a tragic story because he, wound up committing suicide because um, his ideas and his life's work couldn't gain traction among the scientific community. He just couldn't get enough people to believe that the, what he was saying was true. Um, and it sent him into a deep depression along with other things, of course. Um, and eventually he wound up committing suicide. Um, he was a very, very, he looked like kind of an angry, sad guy. There's, there's lots of pictures. He just kind of, um, has a look to him. Um, statistical mechanics is relevant here because they're starting, if you look at the second sentence, we'll begin by considering the simp simplest meaningful example, the perfect gas. That's ideal gas. That's ideal gas law like we've been practicing with. So basically, the idea of the ideal gas law um, came from and is part of what in inspired Boltzmann's research into statistical thermodynamics. Um, why is it that R exists? Why is it that all gases behave this way? And is it really a function of gases or is it just a function of the way, the way that particles move with certain amounts of energy? Was he right? He was right. Um, so part, Part of what he did was he, he said, okay, well, I'm just going to start treating gas molecules um, as though they're just regular spheres. They're just like pool balls moving around. And for macroscopic objects, we have this expression that's been one of Newton's, Newton's? I think this is from Newton. Um, Kinetic energy of, of any object is equal to one half times the mass of the object times the velocity of the object squared. Where are my physics people? Is that that's one of Newton's laws, right? So this has been around since the, the 1600s. Boltzmann was the one who said, "Well, let's take that and we're just going to apply it to molecules moving around as gases. Just treat them like they're all just spheres moving around, and so that." Boltzmann was the one who came up with this expression um, where he makes a bit of a substitution. He says the average kinetic energy is equal to one half times Avogadro's number times the mass of the individual objects 
and it uses u u bar squared. Um, u is basically treating velocity of all of the individual pieces, and bar means average. Um, and so basically, this is just a way of applying. This is for one single object. This is for a group of objects. So, and what, what this says is it comes down to that molecules at the same temperature have the same average kinetic energy, not necessarily the same velocity. If they have the av same average kinetic energy, then we can actually use that, just use the same logic as a golf ball with the same kinetic energy as a bowling ball. Which one's gonna be moving faster? Golf ball, right? You have to throw a golf ball a whole lot harder to give it the same amount of kinetic energy. Imagine trying to throw a golf ball hard enough to knock down 10 pins. Um, that would be, move, that'd be moving, like, um, so that allows us to actually estimate just based on the size of the molecules what's moving faster. Jay? Mass versus the mass of that compound. So we would actually have a different, we'd have a different mass number for every compound if we had a mixture. Okay, but is it like so each like individual molecule? Sorry, yes, it's each individual molecule. So we're doing it in AMU. Actually, technically, we're doing it in kilograms using a definition of atomic mass units. That's why we're multiplying by Avogadro's number. Basically, yeah. Yeah, it's a good catch. So at the same temperature, would argon or helium be moving faster? Helium smaller, so if they have the same energy, argon is going to be slower, and helium is going to be moving faster. Does it matter if it's an element or if it's CO2? Same logic, right? We're treating all of these. It doesn't matter even that CO2 has, is a linear geometry and it's really more like a cylinder shape than it is a sphere. Mathematically, that doesn't matter. And if it's a gas, they're not really running into each other all that often, right? So we can just treat it like it's like it's still just a sphere. So CO2 or nitrogen is gonna be moving faster. Nitrogen is smaller, therefore it'll be moving faster. All right, and when we say the average kinetic energy, basically it's it's saying, take the integral of the entire set of molecules. This represents the potential um, or the kinetic energy for the entire system where N is how many atoms or molecules are gonna have that amount of energy. So if you integrate the entire thing all the way out to infinity and then find what is the average kinetic energy, you get something that's like right there. It's a little bit right of the actual peak because this it's skewed way off to the side, right? So basically what this, what that average kinetic energy is, is solving for is it's allowing us to calculate what's that, that value there. So what happens if we increase the temperature? The average kinetic energy goes higher. So what does that do to this function? What is this function gonna look like? Pushes it this way. It's still gonna end at, at zero, but it's gonna get, basically it's gonna get flattened out. So now kinetic average kinetic energy is up here. Right, so basic, as you, as you increase the temperature, all you're really doing is you're just tweaking what the distribution is. It's always gonna have the same shape, it's just a matter of how flat it is. Which, and this is part of the reason that equilibrium changes based on temperature and part of the reason that rates of reactions, we haven't talked about rates in this class, um, but the rate of a chemical reaction changes based on temperature too. Because if you have some sort of 
energetic barrier for a reaction to happen. You have to have a molecule that has more than X amount of energy. We call that the activation energy. Activation energy is kind of like how if you think of, um, I always use altitude as a good analogy here. Um, how, how much energy would a car have to have to make it out of the basin? You have to have enough energy to get over one of the passes, right? Which that pass is basically the activation energy. And if you have, if we say our activation energy is up here, by changing the temperature, initially the, the black line here, only a tiny fraction of the molecule, not a tiny fraction, I don't know, maybe 5% of that integral is above that activation energy, which means at any given time, only 5% of the molecules have enough energy to go through the reaction. But if you increase the temperature, the red line has maybe 15%, maybe 20% has enough energy to make it above that activation energy which means the reaction is gonna happen faster, just statistically, because you've got one out of every five molecules has enough energy to go through the reaction. That's part of what I did in grad school. We did computational chemistry. In order to calculate activation energy, which I'm sure that's not the answer you were hoping for. Um, yes, go to grad school and you can learn how to calculate activation energy. Um, no, we can go backwards. If we can measure the rate of a reaction, we can work backwards to get to activation energy from that. Um, you can also get to it in computationally if you, if you know what the shape of the molecules are, if you know what the geometries are of all the individual molecules, you can calculate the energy of that state um, just from, from quantum mechanics, from first principles, um, which gives you a pretty good estimate of what the activation energy for a, for a reaction can be. Um, which is pretty cool, but it's also really, really, really obnoxiously hard to do um, in mathematically. It does not scale well. Computational ab initio calculations in particular, the most efficient and least accurate computational um, ways you can calculate this, they scale at n, n to the fourth, where n is the number of electrons in the system. So, and that means if you double the number of electrons in the system you're trying to calculate, that's two to the fourth times longer computationally. So it scales, it goes off the charts in terms of how much computational time you need very, very quickly. I wasn't even doing very big systems. And at one point I got onto a supercomputer before it was open to the general public um, and ran some calculations. I was on more than, see, I was on more than 70% of the 30th largest supercomputer in the world at the time. Um, and it, I was still only doing stuff that had like, you know, 20 heavy atoms. Um, so anyway, Jay. Um, so reactions like at any given time, because that's kind of why you never get 100% of a reaction. You never have all of the atoms above, all of your molecules above that activation energy. Exactly. So if I'm going I'm to erase this real quick and draw a different graph. This is called a potential energy surface where you have energy here. We have, we just call this a reaction coordinate or basically how much the reaction progresses. If our, if our reactants have a certain amount of energy and then they have to go through the pass, the activation energy, and then they wind up being lower in energy than what they started with. This change in energy, that's our activation energy. So I'm going to just write as E sub A for activation energy. Well, for the reverse reaction, if we started here and went backwards, there's an activation energy for that too, right? It's just a lot bigger. So going from here to here would be the activation energy. Sometimes you put it to negative one, meaning it's going in reverse. But that still means there's going to be a finite number of molecules down here in that Boltzmann distribution. There's a finite number of molecules that have enough energy. It's never going to be zero because that Boltzmann distribution goes out to infinity. 
So there's always going to be some tiny amount of molecules that can go backwards. So it might mean that you're favoring making almost all of it into product, but there's still going to be some of it that's going to wind up reacting backwards at the same time. So when this switches mass and going down, it's going to have to the opposite. So say that again. So the activation energy is not at the mass. So it's, yeah, we can, again, go with altitude as a good analogy here. This is us at lake level, right? Here's the pass. Once you get to the pass, you can sort of coast down to Carson or wherever you're going, right? From here to there doesn't take as much gas. That happens almost instantly. Getting from here to there, that's the part that slows it down. Wait, so where on the graph is the... Area by the molecules that can go backwards, and you said that won't be included. So, we if we draw that Boltzmann distribution again, so it looks like this. This should go to zero, but I'm just drew it sloppily. If let's say that this is our our forward activation energy, that would mean like almost you know, almost a third of our molecules have enough energy to go from here to here. But the reverse activation energy might be way up here, in which case only, you know, 1% of the molecules have enough energy to go backward. And so that's why we wind up with equilibrium not being even, because it takes a lot more energy to go from here back up than it does to go from up here in the basin down to Carson. All right, so two different graphs. I know um, I'm kind of, they have, they have a lot of connections. This is kind of explains the why for how equilibrium works and how, um, and how chemical rates work. But it's not, not that critical that you be able to draw this graph at this point. Um, I just always like to make, make things make sense in my head. And this is why equilibrium exists. Um, in theory, if we did a reaction at absolute zero, well, we couldn't really do a reaction at absolute zero. If we, because if we took it to absolute zero, this graph gets compressed to be a delta function right here. Everything has zero kinetic energy, which means nothing has enough energy to get over the activation barrier, which means nothing ever happens. Everything stays right here. Picture. There's no gasoline in the basin. Nobody's car is driving uh, through the pass, right? Is that the cars that don't move that exactly. If they don't move, they can't have any kinetic energy. If they don't have any kinetic energy, they can't get over the pass. So we just went through about 100 years of statistical thermodynamics in 15 minutes. Um, we're not going to do any of the math for that in this class. That's upper division science major math. Um, if we wanted to get an expression, so here's the other part that Boltzmann contributed. Um, the ideal gas constant, if you take the ideal gas constant and you divide by Avogadro's number, you actually get a different constant that's actually named after Boltzmann. And it's basically a, a a um, constant that turns out that R, the ideal gas constant, is basically just a measure of how randomness works, um, how disorder works in general. So this expression, he also came up with this expression where he said kinetic energy average is equal to three over four R times the absolute temperature. Three over four, or sorry, three over two. Man, I'm really off my game today. Not only can I not do simple algebra, I can't even read. <clears throat> it's Friday. This is my last work day till January. So many plans for break. Really? Um, yeah, I have a whole week off with my kids still in school next week. It's going to be oh, wonderful. That's I, have a, I have a staycation. Uh, and then we go to Minnesota.
It's going to be cold. Actually, not yeah. cold enough, actually. It's very warm up there right now. Can't even go snowmobiling, let alone ice skating. Yeah, it's pretty warm. But quit trying to distract me. We're going to get through this. <laughs> All right. So I'm not going to have you work through this, this whole process on your own. But what you can do, we can actually get an expression based on things we can measure. Um, if we just do a quick substitution and solve for u. Remember, u is the average velocity. So we wind up with u squared is equal to, we're going to wind up with 3rt over Avogadro's number. Because the 1 half cancels out with the 2 on the other side. Oh, and mass. I knew there was one more term there. Um, and like I mentioned before, R divided by Avogadro's number is its own constant, is KB, lowercase k, not an uppercase k. So I usually write as a cursive to distinguish. Boltzmann constant times Avogadro's number is equal to R, the ideal gas constant that we've been using. Joel? Um, that's a good, it's, it's a measured number. Um, I don't know about in the mathematical definition. You have to be careful using saying natural number. Um, it's it might be an irrational number though, like pi and E. I don't know about if it's considered a natural number. It's, it's been a long time since I took that math class. Um, ask your math teacher. So what this really gives us though, is it, it allows us to actually find a way we can actually predict what the average kinetic energy or what the average velocity is of a gas molecule. If we just know the temperature and what the gas molecule is. We would have to square root it to actually solve, yeah. So if we wanted to actually get a number just, just for fun, let's do nitrogen at room temperature. We need to make, if we want this to work out right, we need our mass to be in kilograms because we're doing physics equations now, right? We have to be careful with R. It's not going to be atmospheres. Temperature is going to be Kelvin. This is going to be, um, this is just Avogadro's number. I think we need, yeah, we need R to be in the other value of R which is 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. And let's see, and what's the mass of the nitrogen? N2 is 28.01 grams per mole. We need that in kilograms per molecule. Well, gram, we can do we can go moles to molecule pretty easily, right? 28.01 grams for one mole. And if we say one mole is 6.02, 10 to the 23rd molecules. And then we just need to go grams. 10 to the three grams is one kilogram. And the minus 20? Sorry, this this end is nitrogen. Since we're, I said we're going to do nitrogen at room temperature, since that's most molecules in here. So mass, there's our mass, T. Just say it's two ninety eight Kelvin. It's close to room temperature. Sorry. It's not going to be zero point six eight times ten to the negative fifty. Is it or is it yeah, it is going to be per molecule. 
but that's going to wind up not mattering because we're we're solving for the average kinetic energy per molecule as well. So it's just going to wind up getting carried through. It's not going to really affect anything else. Has anybody plugged it in? What do we get? We're going to wind up with Kelvin canceling out Kelvin. Moles is going to cancel out, or we're dividing by Avogadro's number. That's going to make R uh, cancel out the moles in Avogadro's number. What do we get? Yeah, we want temperature in Kelvin. So I just put, I use 298 instead of 25. It's NA Avogadro number. And NA is Avogadro's number. That's after you square rooted it? Yeah. That's, that's low. I'm thinking that we did substitution, cancel things out. Maybe it's this. Maybe we divided by Avogadro's number twice. We might not have needed to do that. We probably could have left this, and maybe this is in grams per mole since we have everything else in terms of moles. Either way, because it winds up being something more that's more like 100 meters per second usually. But I'm not going to actually have you do this the way we're actually, I will actually ask you questions about this is relative to other things. So the way this is going to apply is that when we talk about how gases move, we talk a lot of times we don't put it in, in units of, in absolute units, like meters per second or an actual amount of time. We put it in terms of relative to something else. Because if we just want to compare two different gases, we don't actually need most of that uh, equation, because most of that equation, if all of our gases are in the same container and are the same temperature, then we really can just look at everything. The only thing that's not going to cancel out is going to be the mass of the gases. And so we wind up with this, with this um, equation where we can say that the rate of a gas moving through a material relative to another gas is equal to the square root of molecular weight of B over molecular weight of A. So what does this mean? When gas gases effuse, when we say gases effuse, we just mean they move through a barrier. Think about when you have a, high, a helium balloon. Does it stay filled with helium forever? No, especially not not the the uh, expandable latex ones, the silvery mylar ones. They they hold helium a little bit better, um, but even those, they still lose a lot of their pressure, right? That's effusion. Effusion is how gases move through a barrier or through a a hole, and that's basically what's happening with the helium in a balloon. Is the helium molecules are so much smaller, are so small that they're able to move through the plastic pieces the plastic plastics in general are, are these big long polymers that are just sort of a mismatch of all these long strands well heliums are small enough that they can actually just go through those it's like like a minnow in a fishing net right and yeah you can keep them kind of contained for a little bit but eventually they wind up all kind of escaping the rate of effusion is gonna be based on how big the molecules are. Because if you had a much bigger gas molecule, then if that's a helium and say that's a CO2, CO2 is gonna have a lot harder time making it through that net, right? It still could get through it eventually, but it's gonna be a lot more, it's gonna be a lot more slowed down. And the rate, the relative rates of how fast gases move through a material 
are based on these equations right here. Like I, like I said, the only thing that's not going to be the same if we plug in um, different masses, Avogadro's number doesn't change, R doesn't change, temperature doesn't change if everything is in the same room or in the same container. The only thing that's different is the masses. Trickiest thing here is that little B over A. It's inversely proportional to the square root. So B is on bottom here and B is on top there. So if we had helium and nitrogen in our balloon, how much faster is the helium going to make it through that material? Well, it says how much faster. We're not looking for meters per second faster or a certain amount of time faster. We just mean relative to nitrogen. Nitrogen is going to be going slower, right? Because it has a higher mass. So helium is going to be going faster. How much faster? We just plug in, plug in their masses. So if we're talking about rate of helium compared to the rate of nitrogen, we just plug in their masses. Nitrogen is 28 grams per mole. Does it matter if we're grams per mole or kilograms now? This is the, as long as we're consistent, this is the other reason why this is useful is we don't get into the, well, did we divide by Avogadro's number one time extra or what did we do wrong? It doesn't matter. As long as it's the same, so we can just stick with grams per mole. That's what we're used to. Yeah, so 28 divided by four is what? 28 divided by four? Seven-ish, right? And then we're gonna take the square root of seven, so something between two and three. With more sig figs, Jay, what was it? If you put the, the bigger gas on top, then you're gonna get a number that's less than one. And since we usually like to talk about relative things as being whole number ratios, if we solved it the other way, we'd get one over this number. Yeah, right. If we put the nitrogen up here and the helium on bottom. Okay. Yeah. Helium is mass is four, isn't it? You were thinking about hydrogen. Yeah, hydrogen would go even faster because hydrogen is even is half the size of helium, which is actually something that you, that you might not think about. That's actually one of the biggest problem with hydrogen, a hydrogen based fuel economy, um, is that hydrogen gas is really really hard to store because it effuses through everything really really easily. You think about how thick the steel is that you have to have to store helium gas. And if you want hydrogen to be able to be stored as long as the helium, you have to make it twice as thick. Um, so you, you, there's actually was actually a huge research field just into well, how do we store hydrogen better in a way that could be like useful to the average consumer or for engineers. So does all gas through every material? To some extent. It winds up being really really slow if you do things right but yeah eventually your gas will get through anything yeah it does actually that's one of the biggest it's biggest problems with making an entirely contained space station um is that there's just too many points of failure it's not always directly through a material every time you have a joint there's a there's a small chance that you're going to lose a small amount of gas right so you can never really make an entirely closed space station that doesn't need to be refueled because at some point you're going to be running out of oxygen or running out of gas um, just from natural amount of waste. And, and it, um, there's a really, it's a really, really good science fiction author um, who 
lives in Davis, actually. His name's Kim Stanley Robinson. Um, he wrote a trilogy back in the late 80s that I think has been updated now about what terraforming Mars would look like um, called Red Mars, Red Mars, Green Mars, Blue Mars um, was the trilogy. But he also has a book. What's that? I think that's backwards. I think it, because it was green before they had water. They had, they had mosses and stuff growing, lichens and stuff growing. Um, I think it's been a long time since I read that trilogy. Um, but he also has he also has a, a short story about trying to build a generation ship, meaning a ship that's going to go from one star to another star at sub light speeds. So it's going to take like 200 years to get there. And the and what would go into making it a truly enclosed environment, trying to make it with perfect amount of uh, recycling and zero loss. And that was and it's one of the many reasons I love him as an author is he's not the best at characterization, but his plot and his science is always spot on. It's like, what are you going to do? You're always going to lose some small amounts of, of these gases, um, no matter what you do. Even more impressive, most of the best hard sci-fi writers, authors, were scientists or science majors at least first he was actually just an english major who self-educated himself and talked to the right people um, and taught himself everything that he needed to know about these different different worlds he was creating all right what are we looking we've got 15 minutes last concept this is also related to statistical thermodynamics but it's a little bit more of a stretch until you know how this is an equilibrium concept uh, it's called le chatelier's principle uh, and i always spell name wrong something like that the chatelier's principle just says that if you have a system at equilibrium and you disturb that equilibrium the reaction, the system naturally will move back to equilibrium, which kind of makes sense. If you have system at equilibrium and then you change something about it, it's not at equilibrium anymore, right? Equilibrium happens when we, if we look at that potential energy surface from before, when you had the, the same rate going forward is backwards, right? Hence the two arrows. If you have it such that all the concentrations and the temperature are all balanced out so that it's going backwards at the same rate that it goes, it's going forwards, it looks like nothing's happening, right? Well, what happens if all of a sudden, if you added extra product? All of a sudden, if you have extra product over here, that's going to speed, speed up the reverse reaction, right? And it's going to wind up naturally moving itself back to equilibrium. Because, and it's not like it's, I don't particularly like um, the way it's, it's phrased, the system will shift its equilibrium position. The system is not consciously doing anything. It's not trying to do anything. It naturally finds equilibrium just because if the reverse reaction starts happening faster, then all of a sudden you start getting more reactant, which means the forward reaction can start happening faster again, and they'll eventually balance each other out again. So that's a really kind of abstract concept. But the way we usually think about it is it just means if we started with, if we had this reaction that we've used before, nitrogen plus hydrogen makes ammonia. If it's sitting in equilibrium, these lines here, green is hydrogen, red is, is ammonia, blue is nitrogen. If you add hydrogen all of a sudden, the hydrogen will start going away. It'll use up a little bit more of the nitrogen and you'll make a little bit more ammonia and you'll get back to the same equilibrium ratio once it balances out. The K doesn't change. And what happens if you, if we have something in equilibrium, we'll use this, this reaction. So concentration, it's the way it's written, it's ammonia as the product, right? 
squared over if it's at equilibrium and this is this is true if you change this if this number gets too big all of a sudden to get back to equilibrium you need to balance out the top and bottom again right so basically you're going to have an ice table where all of a sudden your i is really going to be your equilibrium concentrations of everything plus extra on the hydrogen and then your change is going to be how does it get back to equilibrium again and the way we talk about this um, is generally in terms of the equilibrium shifts towards the products or towards the reactants. So the way it's written here, if we, for this setup, we're at equilibrium, then we add extra hydrogen over here to get back to being balanced. We need to take some of the stuff over here and turn it into product. And then we can get back to that same ratio we had, right? So we would say that that equi equilibrium is going to shift towards the products by doing that. If we added extra ammonia, if it's at equilibrium and then we add extra ammonia, it's going to shift back that way, right? It's always going to go the opposite direction because it's going to, it's going to try to get back to that same ratio of products over reactants. What about if we did something like, what if we took away a product instead of adding extra? If we took away product, what's that gonna do? Then the reaction would try to get back to having that more of this again, right? So this is actually one of the ways we can kind of, we can use this idea um, to actually get a reaction to go past where it would normally stop in terms of equilibrium. If we have a way of removing one of these, we can get it to keep reacting, trying to get to equilibrium. We just never let it get to equilibrium because as soon as we make more ammonia, we remove it. So that's actually one of the, one of the more clever um, advances in the early 1900s um, is this setup here where you add nitrogen and hydrogen into the system. This whole system is all one big um, container. So you have all the gases can move around um, freely, the, but ammonia condenses at about minus 30 Celsius and nitrogen condenses at minus 200 Celsius. And hydrogen is at about four Kelvin, so even colder than that. So what they're able to do is normally this reaction stops K is something like um, 0 0.002 or something like that. So it doesn't favor make more product. But if you put a condenser in there that cools down the gases, the ammonia turns into a liquid and falls out of solution or falls out of the, the gas phase. And you wind up being able to collect it as a liquid at the bottom. And that basically keeps it from ever reaching equilibrium. And if it never reaches equilibrium, it's constantly trying to get to equilibrium. We can actually continually make more grams, more moles of ammonia than we could if we just put it all together and just let it reach equilibrium. Yeah, you do have to continuously add more because you'll eventually run out of these. Um, this was this is the one that was a big deal in World War One because ammonia was a limiting reactant for making gunpowder in and early industrial settings. Um, they literally had to mine ammonium nitrate out of the ground, mostly in South America. Um, so Fritz Haber in Germany, despite Germany being blockaded, I think I've told this story before, um, but it might make more sense now, was the one who figured out that you can do this. You can use Le Chatelier's principle and nitrogen is just available in the air and you can make as much hydrogen as you want if you just supply electricity to water. So as long as they had water and air, they could continue to make gunpowder. Um, and it was because of this, the way he figured out how to sort of game the system a little bit, to tweak Le Chatelier's principle um, to, to produce more product than he wanted. So 
last and so it's it's pretty easy when we're talking about adding or removing products and reactants. Um, there's a couple other things that are a little bit trickier. Let's say we have a, a change in volume. If we have a reaction where everything's happening is a gas, don't know why you erase that. This this one works just fine. What happens if we decrease the volume? What happens to measurable properties of a gas? These are all gas molecules. We decrease the volume, what goes up for a gas? Pressure goes up. If K is based on pressures, if it's KP or if KC, it works the same way. It just has to do a conversion. If we decrease the volume, that's going to change the relative pressures of everything, right? And that's going to throw off our, our proportions, our ratios all of a sudden, right? Um, but we don't actually have to go through the process and do the substitution and figure out whether or not it needs to go left or right. If you decrease the volume, it always moves towards the side, the side that has fewer gas molecules. Because if you decrease the volume, you increase the pressure, right? And the system tries to undo that by making fewer gas molecules. So if we're at equilibrium, we make the pressure go up. All of a sudden, we're going to start making more product. Because this is the side of the reaction that has fewer gas molecules. It's going to undo that increase in pressure. So for the reaction down here, the sulfur trioxide, which side has more gas molecules? Products, right? So if you, let's flip it. If you increase the volume, is it gonna go towards more gas molecules or fewer gas molecules? More gas molecules. Increasing the volume drops the pressures, right? If yeah. you drop the pressure, the system tries to undo that by moving towards the side with more gas molecules. And so, again, this isn't something we're gonna necessarily calculate. The way I'd ask a test question about this would be, here's the system, it's at equilibrium. We make this change. Does it move towards the reactants or towards the products? Right, so very qualitative. Um, I can actually write it in a way that there is no change. What if you have the same number of gas molecules on both sides? then changing the volume doesn't change anything, right? Because you're still at that same ratio, no matter what. No, we're assuming ideal gas molecules. If we are not in ideal gas molecule behavior, then this doesn't work. Um, last, last but not least, if we have energy, changing hands, if we have an exothermic or an endothermic reaction, we can treat energy like it's a reactant or a product. So this is an, mm, this is endothermic, right? this is gonna be endothermic. This is an endothermic reaction, meaning you have to put energy in, it gets colder when you do this, right? So is energy a reactant or a product? It's a reactant, energy plus nitrogen plus hydrogen. So if we increase the temperature, which way will the equilibrium shift? It goes that way. We can just treat energy like it's a reactant or a product. So increased temperature means extra energy, which means it's gonna to try to undo that by shifting over this way. If it's exothermic, the opposite's true. It's exothermic energy is a product and increasing the temperature is going to shift it back that way. Right? Key point with Le Chatelier is just the system tries to undo whatever you do. System is happy at equilibrium. It's stable at equilibrium. Everything is balanced. When you change something, it tries to get back to balanced. All right. Have a good weekend, everybody. There will be a quiz this weekend and there's that assignment next weekend. And I'll see everybody in January. Before you leave, I have a question. Um.